Okay, so I'll start the I'll start the presentation. So um, today's presentation is going to be application security and how that is a community effort and how we in the community can make application security better. And I'll go through some of my experiences. So my name's Fernando. I currently work at GitLab and I'm a developer advocate, but my former role was an open source developer on different projects. So I worked at on IBM Cloud, but my role was mainly open source contributions. So back in the days of OpenStack, I was a core contributor for Barbican, which was the key management project. I was responsible for doing threat modeling for various OpenStack projects and was part of the overall security team. So I did a lot of work around that. Um, and I got to learn really how to work with the community and work in open source from that role. And then I brought back a lot of that and I'm a big advocate of open source, which is a reason why I'm here in this conference. So this is a, a rough agenda that's gonna go over the key benefits of having an open source community for security and how we drive innovation and collaboration. Um, what are some of the best practices for engagement and what are some of the challenges that we're gonna see when we're trying to actually have a community and we're gonna try to develop and add different things and we'll go over some of those items but I just wanted to give a spotlight from some contributors to our platform, which is that by contributing to GitLab, a whole new world opened of things to learn. And that's one really attractive thing that you get from contributing to open source in general. And that's from one of, one of our contributors that started contributing to GitLab. And it's just not just GitLab, but just the open source community in general is where you learn. Like, I think I learned the best from actually contributing to open source and working with a lot of you know really intelligent people, really people that have been involved in the field and collaborating, not just internally, but with everyone from different backgrounds, different organizations that have different reasons for contributing different things. So that's one big thing that uh, I've learned and has helped me grow, not as only as a developer, but also as a person. And that's one thing that we see. One of the benefits is this collective expertise that you have all these people with various experiences and their different knowledges and they can all be put together to actually, you know, make, make security better. There's also the transparency aspect. So security is not just the responsibility of the security team. It's actually the responsibility of everybody within the organization. That meaning that it's uh, HR's responsibility, it's my responsibility as a developer, it's everyone needs to collaborate and they need to follow policies that are generated. They need to make sure that developers need to make sure that they understand what secure coding is, what to do around secure coding, and that'll lead to faster detection and faster resolution of all security issues and for a more secure um, you know, organization as a whole. And one example of this can be seen with the XZ vulnerability that happened a few months ago. If anyone is familiar, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. But what ended up happening is essentially someone who was doing um, research and performance testing was able to find out that there was actually a backdoor injected into a particular um, system. And I linked here, and you can also download this PDF, so with links, but there's a really good um, Twitter or X post that shows kind of how this outbreak happened from when it was added and to when it was detected. And that's because we have so many people that can see the code and can examine everything going on that they can find things that you wouldn't be able to find in a black box or closed source type of um, application so it's more secure because of transparency there's discussions you can find discussions where people argue that transparency is bad people argue say transparency is good but overall i think transparency having more people to vet what's going on makes it a lot easier to assess and to resolve these types of vulnerabilities so that was one of the major um uh, examples that that I saw but there's so many more that you can see where just different things were found and as we see more um, threat actors a lot of primary threat actors are within your own organization so you need constant eyes like in this particular case someone actually got the trust of everyone 
and they were bought out by you know some type of nation actor nation state and then they were able to contribute these things so it's kind of like you know by having more people and more eyes on it there's more trust that there there's going to be um vetting and proper uh, checks and balances and then there's also continuous improvement now this is a tricky one because it depends on the community itself and we'll get to that when i go over like the hard hard parts but it's based off of the community itself some communities die and they fall off and they're not active and you need to really figure out um, what you're using and what you're supporting how you can maintain that and maintain activity to a project and that's not an easy thing um, that's really difficult to actually have people continuously contribute and use the product and you need sometimes you need backing from different organizations to really achieve this because you, as you've seen there's many open source projects which come and go and they're replaced by something else and that's one of the tricky parts that we can have a discussion about is how do we really maintain activity within an open source community um, another thing that you're going to see is reduce uh, costs um, reduce development costs because these things already exist so because of this, um, there's shared maintenance and support burden. There's a lower barrier for entry for different organizations. And we at GitLab do this very same thing. So, um, so here are some examples of GitLab security scanners. And with all these security scanners, you can see that we use various open source tools. So a lot of our scanners, what we do is we build upon what's already available. So for example, for DAST, we have OWASP Zap. It's based off of that. But then we add different uh, crawlers, different things that can, you know, really dig into the product and detect, you know, the APIs or detect the pages. Um, our container scanning solution is based off of Trivi. So rather than reinvent the wheel, we take all these different scanners and what we do is we might add different rule sets on top of it. For example, for secret detection, it's GitLeaks space, but then we have our own rule sets that we add to GitLeaks to, for more specific patterns, things within GitLab. Um, same thing for SAS. Sometimes we use SEMGREP based scanners. Sometimes we use um, some proprietary scanners that we develop in house, but they are open source. They're just maintained by us, but anyone can contribute to these products. But we kind of try not to reinvent the wheel and use what's available out there for this. And then there's, um, so that's, these are the ways that, some of the benefits that you get from these um, open source security communities. But if you really want to drive collaboration and innovation, there's ways to do it. Um, big one is knowledge sharing. So there's so many different security communities. It's hard to name. I've provided some uh, links here to some of the more well-known ones. So if you download this um, presentation, you can get those links. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with like OWASP. Um, and with OWASP, there's so many tools, especially for developers that are starting to do training, like Juice Shop. If you've ever used, has anyone here used Juice Shop before? So Juice Shop is actually really good for um, trying to do injection type of vulnerabilities, trying to go through the system. So it's a tutorial based thing, kind of like um, different services like Hack the Box and different things like that. But it's a project that anyone can just stand up and use and it enables for developer education. So one important thing that I did at the start of my career is I had to take courses on secure coding and kind of understand what's out there and how to code things securely because so many things are susceptible to SQL injection. There's so many projects that are not regularly security scanned. It's not part of the pipeline. It's growing, it's definitely growing and it's becoming more of the norm. But go back 10 years, it was definitely not the norm and things had to be scanned separately. People wouldn't have these things in their pipeline. They wouldn't shift left. So you had to really educate developers on this and the world is changing. People are more becoming more aware but one of the good ways to really learn about vulnerabilities and what's going on is to use OWASP. So like the top 10 um, goes over the, what are the top 10 uh, vulnerabilities of each year and what's the percentage that they're detected. Um, you can use Juice Shop to then actually exploit them yourselves because you may have a vulnerability that's detected but maybe it's not exploitable. There's like different tools that are available nowadays that maybe you're using a dependency 
but you're using a function in that dependency that's not vulnerable, yet the scanner detects that it is vulnerable, there's tools that you can put in place to then kind of say, okay, is my thing vulnerable? And then you can do different analysis, try to exploit things. And it's a team effort because it's not going to be just done by one person, right? Developers are going to develop code as secure as they can, but then you need pen testing, then you need collaboration with different communities to figure out how to respond to a threat, how to mitigate something. So these are all some really useful resources. And one that we actually have here, that's actually here in Vienna, uh, that's gonna be here on Thursday, is the OpenSSF. And this is a great organization to learn more and get more involved with different security initiatives. They have different tools uh, to get started, to start contributing, to learn about security in general. So I would really advise everyone to, um, you know, on Thursday, make the best of the effort while this community is already here to learn how you can get involved and to learn more from, you know, experts that are really involved in the field as, as we currently speak. But, um, and there's gonna be forums, there's on X um, or Twitter, there's also many security communities that you can follow and things, I'm really surprised by that platform of how many people from the security community are there and constantly collaborate on different things. There's so many um, uh, have become influencers now within YouTube that you can watch different videos. One of them that I watch a lot is Mental Outlaw or uh, Jason Hammond. They all provide such detailed um, viewpoints as to the most uh, found exploits and kind of go through a walkthrough of everything and not just security, not just application security, but just security in general, maybe physical security, maybe, um, you know, just different things like that. And you can also attend fishbowls. Once you become active contributor, you can you have more of an input on what goes in and you can attend fishbowls where you have discussions on design and planning. So I was lucky and fortunate enough to be part of a lot of those for um, the OpenStack community when when um, when I was working key management, you know, like eight eight or seven years ago. And then um, tool development is going to be probably one of the biggest things that the security community focuses on is just different scanners, different tools to um, do tracing, um, different things like that. And the tool that you're looking for, you might not have to build in-house. You can already use it from open source, and then you can contribute back a specific feature that you may need for it. So these are some examples of tools that, that you may see. In, like at GitLab, we use GitLeaks to detect secrets, we add on top of that. But I'm sure man, many of you may have uh, either used or heard of Wireshark to trace packets. Um, there's Kali Linux, which is big for people learning, the deployment of Linux, people learning how to do penetration testing. Um, there's tons of resources out there. Um, and um, it's good to be an active participant in these things. Has anyone gone to, uh, what is it, Black Hat or DEF CON or any of these conferences. So in those conferences, it really makes you excited about security just because it's not just, um, you know, corporate security. You get to learn from so many individuals and there's like a lot of fun, crazy stuff that happens too um, at DEF CON, but you get to learn from people that are actively practicing this and you get to see it actively being practiced at the conference. For example, one of the cool things that they had was a thing called wall of sheep and it was pretty much people that they hacked at the conference so they they didn't actually like log into their um you know their bank or anything but they posted this is the beginning of the username and this is the beginning of the password and these people uh someone could have just hacked the packets and hacked into their bank account hacked into their gmail wherever they logged in and you see so many people that you know get caught on a day-to-day -day basis and it makes you more aware of you know everything out there and then you learn best practices like um, not only hacking for application security but for like cars people can hack into cars these days people can hack into all these things and that's why security is so important and being making sure you follow best practices because you don't want to have a Tesla and then someone just hacks the uh, brake pedal and just stops you or accelerates you or does something crazy so I mean it's very important and I think as these uh, companies grow they'll probably start open sourcing more things to get more eyes on it, to get you know more transparency and more people involved. And I think there's a big push for that to make things more and more open source, make algorithms more open source because 
um, a lot of algorithms are likely biased towards a particular type of posting. So, you know, by making these things open, then, you know, people can fight against discrimination or fight against different things. So that's a big reason why open source is important. And then you can participate in it by having these discussions. Um, one good way to get started is writing unit tests or functional tests. So while there's high coverage in a lot of projects, there's a lot of projects which barely have coverage. And the way that I started my career after college was um, in open source was actually contributing unit tests. And that was a good way to get involved with the security community. So, you know, I would contribute unit tests for this particular project, functional tests, and then it helps you learn how everything works by doing that. And then just getting the, the getting started guide going through that. So that was very, very beneficial in my early days. And then um, doing different things like uh, reporting uh, CVEs, if you find them, there's a lot of ways to report one. Um, going through communities like HackerOne. So HackerOne's a partner of ours and they help us find vulnerabilities, but we also help them you know, manage different, um, you know, they're a partner of ours, so we help them manage their whole infrastructure uh, and different things like that. So. Um, I think it's a great community. I think there's another one called Project Discovery that just launched that does a, a similar initiative um, to find you know different vulnerabilities in different areas and try to assess that. And you'd be surprised. Some people find the craziest things. Like there was a someone who found like a TikTok vulnerability and being able to change, log into anyone else's TikTok, and that was like a big um, thing at Hacker One. So like there's all these communities that are available for you to like really contribute and find different things. Um, it's also good to have a security first mindset, um, prioritizing secu um, security in everything that you do. So this was the thing back that we did in OpenStack, which was for every single component that we had, um, we did a security review. And it was talking about what are all the entry points in the system, what assets are at risk, what data is there, what is the data at rest, is it in transit, um, are, is a TLS encrypted in transit, different things like that. And this essentially is what's called the threat model. And we would, for every single application, we would do a threat model. And that's another way that you can help if there isn't um, a threat model done for your, for your organization for how an open source software is used. You can do that and then publicize it because it's very helpful to see what data is stored where. And I know um, there's different things that you need in the US, but I know in Europe, I think it's more strict. Um, I can't remember what's that new policy that you have to like provide details that you did everything that you could to secure software. There's like some new initiative here in Europe that talks about that. Um, CRA. CRA, that's exactly what it's called. So the things like that would be really helpful for the CRA and making sure like this is where the data is stored, this is how it's secured, um, things like that. In the, yeah, in the US we don't have things like that right now. Um, yeah, and doing regular audits, things like that, things that people don't think of. When you have a more security aware mindset and you're in open source, you're more aware of like, let me do audits on all these things. Let me like figure all this out and go from there. Um, responsible disclosure is also another thing, um, making sure that when you do find the vulnerability, you follow the best uh, practices on disclosing it. And a lot of times that's likely disclosing that in private to the community maintainers and going through some type of formal process to disclose it. And what you end up doing is you'll, you'll disclose that vulnerability so that way it's private somewhere. Someone can push a fix before they publicize it, so that way there's no malicious actors that become aware of this vulnerability. Sometimes that's, you know, there usually there needs to be remediation or some type of mitigation solution before it's published, because if not, then pretty much everything is unsecure at that point in time. So it really depends, and some organizations are okay with publishing it and letting others know, but usually it's done private first, and then it goes through this whole process um, to become um, public and this is a little example of the uh, CVE lifecycle and how it goes. So, so it's discovered, it's reported through a partner program, and then it's sent over to the CVE database. And then they create an ID. Um, they go through the details from the submitter, and then they start publishing um, these results for the public to view and display. So, if you've ever seen the CVE database, you go through all these different vulnerabilities, and then you can see which ones are present and go from there. 
and kind of this, I won't go too much into it because this is just kind of like once a vulnerability is in your system, you can just kind of go through um, the flow and this is the life cycle that you see. So it goes all the way from um, discovering this vulnerability. So you'll discover it by some of these means like um, vulnerability scanning, auditing, you do penetration testing, monitor the logs and see if there's anything suspicious there. And once that's done, then you need to prioritize this vulnerability. Is it really something critical? Maybe, it, maybe in this vulnerability it only has access to data that's not really important and no one can do anything with. Um, maybe it's uh, very low severity and no one can really do anything really malicious with it. Um, so you gotta like, go through that prioritization and then you assess the actual vulnerability and see how can this be exploited. So you do these steps also to create a report and you try to exploit the vulnerability, you need proof that it actually is a vulnerability. So even if it's you detected in the audit logs, you detected something suspicious, um, you prioritized it, that this was like critical data that it's accessing, then you need to actually assess to see if it works and then you can use different tools to try to exploit it and actually make it happen um, through the different resources that you have. And then you either go through uh, remediation or mitigation. So you either try to limit the impact by mitigating it or you remediate it by completely fixing it, which let's say in dependency scanning, it could be updating to a new version or it could be, you know, if you want to mitigate, it could be maybe closing off certain ports for some functionality or separating some data from something. I mean, there's various, it really depends on what it is that we're talking about, but it's going through those items. And then you revalidate it once it's been fixed, you rescan it, and then you see kind of if, that, if your solution works. That's a very high level of you know, the vulnerability life cycle. And then this is just kind of a little report that we did. This was back in 2019, and well, we should have newer ones. Um, I just couldn't find them, but um, these are the costs that some of our customers reported and the cost of remediation from the beginning to the end. So as far as you get down in the pipeline, the more it costs to remediate these things. And I wanted to point this out because in open source communities, usually they're detected um, and resolved in a, in a really quick nature. It's, it's because so many people are dependent on a project, there's so many eyes on it and so many people working towards that. Rather, if it was in an internal organization, the code was an open source, People can think, oh, maybe it's not, no one knows the vulnerability because it's closed source and maybe they have other priorities that, that there's not so many people focusing on. So, um, so open source in general makes remediating vulnerabilities a lot quicker. And then we'll get to the challenges. Um, one challenge is definitely quality control. And these things, the, the way that these challenges are met are by you know, strict guidelines within a community. Um, a strict guideline example I can think of is making sure that your commit messages are valid and that they're in a certain format and you just don't say, okay, fix one, fix two. So that way when the system's audited, you can see exactly what's um, being pushed and what code's there. That's a, that's a really big one that I've seen in a lot of communities that they won't accept things unless they're a certain way. Um, making sure that you have tests along with the code, making sure that commits are not so large that they can't be reviewed properly, making sure that there's separation of duties. Um, there's so many things that you can do to control the quality. And I think most open source communities that I've worked with do achieve this. I mean, back in OpenStack and Kubernetes, I've contributed a lot to the ingress controller. And then there's certain guidelines like that where things are not accepted unless they're able to be reviewed um, properly. You can't have like a 10,000 lines of code that you change, LGTM, boom, merge. You can't do things like that. Um, people still do it, but if you want to control quality, that's, that's things that you can implement for that. Um, and then sustainability, this is a big one. And this one, I would have questions for y'all about this because how do you sustain an environment? That's probably one of the hardest things that you can do, right? You, you came up with this um, tool. It has so much traction, it's very useful. But at some point in time, contributions drop and people stop contributing. How do you really find the reason why people stop contributing? Is there some type of competitive product that has taken over? Is there, you know, what's really going on? Why are people not putting in the time and focus to this? And a lot of times I saw that during OpenStack where a lot of people shifted towards 
containerization. They shifted towards different ways of deploying things. They went more to the Kubernetes platform, and a lot of people that worked on OpenStack went to Kubernetes. And you can see that the project's um, contributions in OpenStack greatly declined, but another project started taking its place. And these things happen quite frequently, more than we think. And it's just kind of, and this is something I don't have a solution to, and I really don't know, is, you know, how do these things happen? It's a good question for everyone to think about, is, is this community being properly maintained, and how, how can it continue to be maintained? Do we need other resources to get involved for this? Because it, be, it becomes tricky to do this. And there are tools out there that do scan um, how active uh, open source project is to see if it's something that has dropped and no one's contributed for in over a year or are people constantly adding. And you can use that in your criteria when you decide what to use to see is it actively being contributed to. So, and we do things at GitLab um, in certain ways and how we're um, uh, open source. We use the open core model. So there's a lot of GitLab that's published under the MIT license. Um, but then you, we do make a profit by actually, if you apply licenses, you unlock different features. But, um, but it is free and it is all open source as a whole. Even if you need to activate some features with licensing, um, you can still contribute to those features and see what code is running in those features and still um, go and obtain a contributor license to be able to contribute to even the ultimate level features. But, um, but you can contribute to anything pretty much and everything's under the MIT license for the community edition. And we do have a large open source community. We have over 2,000 contributors from outside the company. So one example that we had uh, in Texas, we have a grocery store called HEB and their digital solutions team has, they have a mobile application for ordering groceries and they contributed the, um, an open source scanner for scanning mobile applications for security vulnerabilities. So we, we work with our customers and different customers have different use cases and a lot of times maybe they're not on our roadmap or they're taking a really long time on our roadmap then we encourage like different contributors and we work with them to try to get one of their needs met through different contributions. So that's like one way that we operate is, you know, assisting others that already have this working to contribute it back into the platform and then we support them and provide them what they need for that. So, so yeah, we had a grocery company essentially add mobile security scanning to our pipelines and then it's something that we use now actively and we support with our customers and that was done through a community contribution. And we constantly get different community contributions um, every release that are critical features. So we depend a lot on the community to keep our product active and you know up to date. And then, I mean, there's different ways to contribute. So creating issues, participating in discussions, adding code. But the cool thing is that everything is, um, essentially public. So you can see every single thing that's being developed and going on in GitLab. And this is how we run the, not, not just um, open source, but the company in general. And you can see here what um, we're doing for, this is for our security scanners, right? What direction we're going in, what's up and coming, what's the three-year plan, um, what are the one-year plans? And then you can kind of go down and for all the different items of GitLab, like container scanning, you can see the direction for container scanning, for example, and see what are the different plans um, and you know what are the different strategies. And then you can even be linked to the epics that kind of go over um, you know, what's being added. This is reducing noise, I think, consolidate similar container scanning findings. So you can eat, actually, anyone can add, this is not private or gated, anyone can add um, you know, their opinion, their thoughts, and really drive the direction change. And we've had customers change the direction of it. Different contributors go and change direction of a particular part of the product because they can see it and because they can, you know, say, no, we need to do it like this, we need to do it like that. So it's good to have an open discussion, not just about, you know, adding features, but also about what's being in development. And it run, that's essentially everything that you see in, an, in your, any open source community is that you'll be able to see the issues, the, you know, the roadmaps, different things, and actually anyone can have an opinion 
on what it is. Now, it's good to actually be more involved in the community and be more aware of it, but anyone can really have their voice in an open source community, and that's why it's really important. Like, I can't have a voice on what CrowdStrike is doing, but I could have a voice, you know, in what Kubernetes Ingress is doing, and I can act actively talk because I can see the code and I can go through that. So that's very powerful. Um, languages, in case anyone wants to get involved in GitLab development, um, there's Ruby, Vue.js, Golang, Markdown, and different languages based off of different um, parts of the product. Just because it is a platform, everything uh, links in one place. So everything's separated, but together, if that makes any sense. So if you want to work on a security scanner, for example, and add code or to add rules and things, then you can just go to that particular security scanner, edit that, and then run it within the platform itself. And we offer different things. I'm gonna, y'all can download this stuff from the PDF that's in sched, the scheduled app. But um, there's ways of accessing a GDK. We've added a GDK in a box that's a VM. Um, and then you can also edit through the web IDE or using something like Gitpod and test your changes and different things like that. There's also the concept of community forks, which is instead of you forking um, the project and then adding code that way, you can actually just create a branch on the latest um, fork of the project and then just add your code via branches. So I've added information to learn more about that there. Um, and then the last thing that I want to go over is just the open integration framework. So what that means is how we've developed the product is that we allow anyone to be able to integrate anything into the product. So even if you have a competing solution, but you have customers that use GitLab, you can integrate your tool into GitLab um, as you need. So, so work well with others in that sense. So there's different ways to, for example, you can write your own security scanner you know, that maybe competes with our secret detection, but maybe you're looking for PII data, you can use that and you can populate the results of the um, GitLab vulnerability reports, the what's detected in merge requests, all these different things. You can populate all these things by um, just using the, you know, provided schemas that you need to load, and then you can just integrate the scanner easily into the platform, and then you don't have to um, worry too much about like, doing crazy development to integrate it and contributing. That way you can contribute your own project and contribute an integration as well. Um, there's also the advisory database. I'm sure you've seen this a lot, different advisory databases and different products. So it's a way for us to um, consolidate all the vulnerabilities that we find, not only within GitLab, but within different packages and be able to provide that and update it on a basis and allow different customers to contribute through that or different users to contribute to that advisory database and we'll populate that and it'll go and allow you to enable the, the CVE um, workflow. So essentially, yeah, that's what I wanted to report and I just wanted to you know go over um, kind of any questions that anyone has because I want to make this a little bit more interactive now. So what are questions that you have about getting started with open source or what do you want to learn about within the community? So I'll take a few questions and then, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's been fun. I mean, how, how many of y'all, uh, I'm sure, does everyone here contribute to open source currently? What, what projects are some of them? Salsa? Okay, for networking? No. Or, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a supply chain security framework. Oh, got it. Okay, supply chain security. Um, how about you? Okay, you, you contribute to GitLab already? Oh, cool. And then anyone here? Cool. So every community is uh, very different. So depending on if you want to get started with something it's best to like look at the best practices of that community and see how you can get involved and you know learn from the maintainers i i think every community that i've worked in everyone's like super helpful super useful people really want people to help out and work because there's a lack of people that are actually contributing and doing useful things so i think that it's really good to just 
kind of network, meet people if you want to get started and just collaborate because people are like really willing and really excited for there to be new contributors that maintain that, you know, become maintainers eventually. Like uh, in my in my role, like the way that I started is I was just a junior developer and I really didn't know anything. And I started learning. I had a, I obtained like a mentor from the open source community and started learning how to do small little contributions, learning how this particular tool works and then going from there and then starting to do small um, contributions like a docu maybe fix some documentation that wasn't available. Then I started doing unit tests and then I got to the point where I felt comfortable enough to then contribute a feature, have input on particular discussions and go from there. And it was really, I learned so much from those experiences. And honestly, without those experiences, I don't think I would be like here today, you know, you know, presenting and having like the knowledge that I obtained through that. And it wasn't me that did it on my own. It was done through every single person that knew so much in the industry. And I learned just so much from everybody. And I just kind of, you know, want to really emphasize that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really, really nice, really fast. And it gives you, I know, as many here know, it gives, it gives you an overview of all the dependencies or vulnerabilities found in the dependencies. But it's, it's a flat table. It doesn't say anything about where, where it is in the dependency graph. Mm -hmm. It's a direct dependency, transitive dependency. Yeah. How deep would it be in that graph? And I would like to know, is there any interest, or has there been any interest in figuring out if the dependency graph has changed? Yes, yeah, so there is actually a big interest in that. Um, so what I have seen is, and maybe you can speak better, uh, Tom, maybe you can speak better about that because <laughs> you're more involved in it, but I, at least from where, where I work at GitLab, I can talk about our experience. The, our customers do ask a lot about um, transitive dependencies, so dependencies of dependencies, and we, when we create, generate an SBOM and talk about you know, what's changed and what's there, we don't currently um, differentiate between what is a dependency of a dependency and what is the main dependency. And we're working on that actively because it's been a big ask from our, you know, from different customers and different partners. So I do see a need for that because you want to know at the lowest level when you give these SBOMs what exactly is in the code base. There could be something, you know, that you're not aware of that changed on a lower level. But you know, you, you would want to know that as well. Um, so I'm uh, I'm not sure if it would solve your, your particular use case, but if um, OSV does have a, a guided remediation feature where the idea is that if it tells you that you're vulnerable, um, I don't know to what extent guided remediation is like universally available, but it will tell you like upgrade these things in yeah. order to great. To so so I think uh, so my point is, if there is a vulnerability in a transitive dependency, it will show up, and that's great. Yeah. But if there's it's not no no vulnerability, but I as a developer would still like to know that this dependency, third party dependency, has changed their underlying building blocks mm. in this release, mm -hmm. and that even though they're not reported vulnerabilities in there, that's a big change because yeah. you know, I'm responsible for the finished product. Right. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. So we have some build mechanisms in place, so we would detect that and we'll break the build mm -hmm. if there is a change. But you know that's custom code, and mm -hmm. we really like to know if there are better or other ways of solving that problem. I don't know of any tools that do that today. Mm -hmm. I think that you could get at some of that with with services like uh, like Dev um, and. Beyond that, there's that something that we'd like to, that like, folks would like to address. There's talk of um, having a hermetic build requirement in this also build, build track where everyone would need to pre clear all of their dependencies in which case, like, including the transit dependencies. In the and if one of them changes, then your build would fail. Um, mm -hmm. It's still very early days. Yeah, and I think my suggestion would be to put up an issue within the OpenVAS um, ecosystem, put up an issue that's like feature request, 
and then you know add you know to follow the community guidelines wherever they suggest to to open something in there and then add like this requirement and then someone um you know and talk to the community because someone might say hey we're not supporting this because x already does it or maybe they will might say oh that's a good idea let's like work on implementing it there could be a lot of paths that happen once you do that and you can see there there'll be a chain on on this specific use case and i've done that before where i've requested um a feature for something that we needed like storing metadata for a particular item or doing something like this and usually there's other people that are also interested in that and, and i mean i myself think that's definitely something interesting to be able to differentiate between the different ones in that in that scanner because we do it currently i mean we don't do uh you know tamper management or get hashes of the changes or anything like that but we do want we do have customers that do want to differentiate that and enough enough of a need where it's a top priority um, to differentiate between what packages do what and which ones are gotten from where. And I mean, I don't know if it's, it's just part of like, yeah, when you give the SBOM to different organizations that you have to prove what you have. And I think it's useful to prove what the lower stuff is as well and if that's changed. Because then if something does happen and there's an active risk that does happen, maybe it was on the newer version of that thing that changed and you had no idea. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to do that. But like one, one implication is that the, so say you include a, a framework for uh, building an application server and the underlay, underlying dependency change, so mm -hmm. you can do, it has LDAP capability. Mm -hmm. Your QA department has not tested anything mm -hmm. to do LDAP because we didn't, we couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, really good use case, and I think even giving that example when you create the issue, so that's like a good. So this is a really good topic because what, what, like, let's say there's something that you need, but there's a tool that doesn't, it doesn't actually do it then the way to start is to actually start a discussion about getting that feature in there and then maybe you can figure out why it's not done in OpenVast. Maybe they want to keep it a certain way in that community and they're, they're, that's not something that they're willing to support because maybe there's something else that they use for that and then you can kind of go through that. And that, that I think, is an interesting thing to do and a good challenge, really. But yeah. Yeah, so... Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, if you want to further contact me and you know talk about anything, you know, or open source or collaboration, I have my uh, Twitter and LinkedIn handles there. Awkward Fernie. It's funny, but yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I'll be here for a little bit if anyone has like any other questions they want to talk about. Yeah, thank you.